Hey friends, Dr. Dav here. Let's talk about tongues. Tongues, the first question we want to probably ask is, what are they? What's the deal with tongues? What are tongues? Tongues in the Bible, they are a, a spiritual language of prayer and praise. It is something that the Holy Spirit supplies or gives us or uh, in real time. It's not something that we learn to do or practice doing. Uh, it's something that the Holy Spirit uh, produces in us or gives to us when we are and as we are filled with the Spirit. What, what tongues first show up in the Bible at and then after Pentecost. So they are... they. The, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says they were all in one place and there was a sound like a, like, a, like a rushing wind that came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and then they, they all began to speak in other tongues. Now the Greek word is glossolalia. They began to speak in other tongues, languages that they did not know. And in the book of Acts, the, what, what they were speaking Godwardly, they were speaking upwards. Those that were that heard them below heard them miraculously, and that can be explained perhaps at another time. But they miraculously were understanding them each in their own language. And what they heard was, they said, "We hear them uh, speaking the glories or the works of God." So. As the church was filled with the Holy Spirit, they, they responded by speaking in this language of prayer and praise that was a spiritual or a heavenly language, not necessarily an earthly language at all as we see throughout the rest of the Bible. Uh, sometimes it's even called like the, language, the tongues of angels, but it's a heavenly language. That means it comes from heaven, just like it says at the beginning, and a sound that came from heaven. What they were receiving was coming from heaven. It's, in a sense, the church, they were inhaling the breath of God and then exhaling the very voice of God by the Spirit. This happens at Pentecost, and then it happens again throughout the book of Acts every time a new, pers a new person or a new group of people experience the Holy Spirit, they uh, often are, Luke often records that they too began to speak in tongues. In Acts chapter 10, it was how Peter and his Jewish cohorts recognized that the Gentiles had been accepted by God, that God had given them the Holy Spirit too because they heard them speaking in tongues. Peter repeats this story to the Jewish elders and the other apostles in chapter 11, and then he repeats it again in Acts chapter 15 at the the Jerusalem Council when the church is trying to figure out how to get Jews and Gentiles to get along and what rules everybody's going to follow, Peter says, hey guys, remember, God has already accepted them. They've received the Spirit because we know that because we heard them speaking in tongues. Then in Acts chapter 19, Paul comes to a place called Ephesus and he asks them right away at the church at Ephesus, he finds believers, Luke calls them believers, and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they, they did not. They, they said, we don't even know the Holy Spirit has come yet. So he baptizes them in the name of Jesus. He lays hands on them and then they begin to speak in tongues and prophesy. Paul doesn't ask anymore. That settles the aha. So tongues are a spiritual language of prayer and praise. And that's their primary purpose, as we'll talk about in a minute. But they also serve as a, in the book of Acts as an aha that they, they said, aha, you, you, you expressing, you exercising the tongues in that way lets us know we, we recognize that you too have received the spirit. So tongues are a spiritual language of prayer and praise that uh, show up in the Bible because of Pentecost and then again and again after Pentecost. Now, it's not just that they are, they are not a unique one-time experience. What we, what we see in the scripture as we read through, as we see in the book of Acts and then as we, we look through Paul's teaching in the epistles, that we can and that we should speak in tongues often. And I'd like to talk to you for a few more minutes about why. 
We understand what tongues are we, that, and that uh, we, they are volitional. They are not ecstatic. It is not the Holy Spirit grabbing a hold of us, sticking his hand in the back of our head and making us a puppet and making us do things. It is us voluntarily yielding to the influence of the Holy Spirit and, and willingly speaking. And yet what we begin to speak is supplied to us from the Spirit. It's a bit of a mystery. I can explain it all day, but it's better caught than taught. So why should we speak in tongues? Why do I speak in tongues? If I, can, if I can speak in terms of personal testimony or experience, there are at least three reasons why I believe we should speak in tongues. Number one, I speak in tongues because it is, it provides assurance. Now, a lot of times in classical Pentecostal circles, we talk about tongues as initial physical evidence. But the reason why I don't like the word evidence is evidence is something that you put in a manila folder or in a safe or in some sort of a bin and you, and you can stick it and tuck it away in a locker or a garage and never see it again, but you just know it's there. That's not what tongues are. They aren't something that we experience once, say, well, we got it and we move on and remember that it happened and we have some sort of evidence of an experience that we once had. No, on the contrary, tongues are assurance. Uh, meaning, they are tongues is something that I can do, I should do, and I do often, regularly, all the time. I practice speaking in tongues because it gives me regular, ongoing, consistent assurance of the same aha in the book of Acts. When I pray in the Spirit... I remember, I recognize that their story in the book of Acts is my story. I am speaking in tongues in the same way that they did in Acts 2 and 10 and 19. And I can recognize that if I'm speaking in tongues like they are, then I have the same Holy Spirit that they do. I have the same Holy Ghost. And that is a tremendous assurance to me. It comforts me. It encourages me that the same Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is present in my life to do exactly what he did in the book of Acts he can do in my life. It gives me assurance of God's abiding presence in my life. And tongues are miraculous. They are, a, it's a miraculous expression. It's not contrived, it's not learned, it's a miracle. So every time I speak in tongues, I am experiencing, I am practicing a real miracle. And what that does for me is tell me that if I can experience the miraculous nature of speaking in tongues in, in one place, then I can experience all of God's power and all and any of God's miraculous kinds of provision in that same place. Whether it's in my home, in a prayer closet, or it's in the church service, or it's on the street, or in a coffee shop, I can, when I begin to pray in the Spirit, I have an immediate assurance that God, very God, the Holy Spirit, the power from on high is present in my life and Anything is possible that God's love and, and power and compassion are ready in that moment. I pray in the Spirit because it gives me assurance that I have received the same Spirit and that that same Spirit is at work in my life. I pray in the Spirit for assurance. The second reason why I pray in the Spirit I, let's call it assistance. The first one is assurance. The second one is assistance. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 26 and 27, Paul says, he said, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, it's important that we remember who's talking. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, for we do not know how to pray as we should. This guy knew how to pray. He memorized all kinds of prayers. 
He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's, he's a member of the, of the tribe of Benjamin. He's trained by Gamaliel. He's the top-notch Jewish scholar of his age and generation. He, he knew how to pray. He's not saying that he was ignorant about prayer. He was saying that in comparison, hold on to this, in comparison to how the Holy Spirit helps us pray, our own ability, if we were to rely on our own ability, we don't even know what we're doing. Now, that's not to discount our prayers, but it is to it is to magnify. It is to exalt how helpful the Holy Spirit is in our prayer. He's saying we don't know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groans we can't utter. And this is a a euphemism. Uh, Paul is talking about praying in the spirit, praying with the language of heaven, that spiritual language that we talked about in, in the book of Acts. So when we pray in the spirit, the Holy Spirit is interceding through us and for us according to the will of God. I believe the Holy Spirit prays better than me. I believe the Holy Spirit knows the will of God. And so I pray in the Spirit knowing that as I do, the Holy Spirit is praying through me and for me. Now, Paul says in in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 8 that we should pray in the Spirit on all occasions. So really this is a matter of obedience as well, but still, Paul recognizes that praying in the Spirit is so helpful, it is such an assistance in our life that we should do it at all times and for all reasons on all occasions. Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 14 and 15, he says, what will I do then? I will pray with my mind and pray with the Spirit. I will sing with my mind and sing with the Spirit. He's not saying I'll do either or. He says I'm going to do both of them. And this is so important that Pentecostals historically have built two separate silos for the Spirit and the mind and never the two shall meet. They've been separated. And what that's done historically is people know how to, they enjoy praying in the Spirit, but they don't have any expectation of that praying in the Spirit is going to have any impact on their own soul, on their own thought life, on their own imagination, on their own character formation. But that's not the point at all. We should pray in the Spirit. Now, Paul says, when when I pray in the Spirit, when I speak in tongues, my mind is unfruitful. That means my mind isn't producing fruit. My mind is not the one doing the work. But my mind can be impressionable. He doesn't say that that I'm I'm not impressed upon by the Spirit. He's simply saying that my mind is not doing the work. But my mind can benefit. It can receive benefit. My soul can receive benefit from praying in the Spirit. Especially... If I do something like this, I, when I pray in the Spirit, I literally fill my mind, oftentimes I'll fill my mind with things that I'm concerned about, things that I need to handle, my responsibilities, my challenges, opportunities that are in front of me. As I meditate on those things, I pray in the Spirit. I pray in tongues. And as I pray in the Spirit, The Holy Spirit is praying through me and for me. Now, I'm not in charge of the Holy Spirit. I can't tell him what to pray, but I do trust him. And instead of just letting my mind be vacant and empty or wander or watch cartoons, (laughs) I fill my mind with things that matter and I pray in tongues. And I trust that regardless of all the other things he may be praying for, he may be praying for someone across the world, he may be interceding for their intervention, but I'm still gonna be thinking about things that that I need his help with. And I believe that he will also be praying with me and through me about those things. And then not only do I meditate on those things and pray in the Spirit, but as I do, I try to listen. I try to really feel how the Holy Spirit might be speaking to me or leading me with regard to those responsibilities or those opportunities or challenges. Many times I have paused and asked, Lord, you know, what, what do you want me to do about a certain situation or a certain uh, um, uh, plan? And I'll pause and I'll pray in the Spirit. And then I just have to, I try to trust whatever 
uh, inclinations I have, whatever plans, sometimes they feel very strong. They and, I, and I'll tell you, you say, well, how do you know what to do? You follow the impulse of love and really love and courage, whatever is going to require the most. But, but, but courage and faith kind of have the same vibe. And the Bible says that faith expresses itself in love. So honestly, you can just trust the impulse of love and think this is where the whole, this is what the Holy Spirit wants me to do. Whatever, whatever impulse of love, whatever sense of peace that I have, I'll do that or I'll act that way. So I pray in the spirit because of the, tre the tremendous assistance he gives. He's praying according to the will of God for me and through me. And he's also speaking to me and helping me, giving me guidance and, and, uh, and, and influence and even assignments throughout the day, which really brings me to the third and final reason why I pray in the Spirit. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 4, he says, He, the person who speaks in an unknown tongue, edifies himself. To edify means to build up, to strengthen, to make bigger. Think about the word edifice. Edify is the verb of edifice. To make something into an edifice, to build, to, to build it bigger and or stronger than it was before. So when I pray in tongues, not only does it give me the assurance, not only do I know that, that God is with me, that, that He's the same God in the Scriptures, not only do I know that the Holy Spirit is praying, He's getting work done through me for others and leading me accordingly, He's also doing something to me. As I pray in the Spirit, something is happening. I can't really explain it, but I sure am thankful for it. When I pray in the Spirit, I am being built up. I am being strengthened. I am being sweetened and strengthened within by the Spirit. It doesn't make God love me more than He did before. It doesn't make me better than the person next to me, but it does make me better than I was a few moments ago. Jude chapter, well, there's only one chapter, but Jude verse 20, he, when Jude writes, he, in, he encourages his audience to build themselves up in their most holy faith by praying in the Spirit. That somehow praying in the Spirit strengthens and builds up our faith, our confidence in God, our awareness of the Spirit, and our confidence in Him is stirred up, is strengthened as we pray in the Spirit. Here's a passage that may not even that you may not even have thought of, but when Paul writes to Timothy and he tells him to stir up the gift of God that is in him, that is in him through the laying on of hands, this to stir up the gift of God it means to exercise it, to put it to use, to do something with it. In the same way, whether or not Paul specifically meant one or two or, or specific spiritual manifestations, we know for sure that, it, that, that it, he can, of course, have included to mean tongues. I stir up the gift of God in me as I exercise it. So I'm literally stirring up the person and work and influence of the Spirit in my life as I pray in the Spirit. The last thing I would say about all of this is, is, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 18. When Paul is talking to the Corinthian church and he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Now the Corinthians were, were tongue talkers. Glossolalia acts. They, they, were at, they went after it. In fact, they did it so much, they did it at the wrong times and the wrong ways. They were trying to teach each other and talk to each other in tongues, and that didn't make any sense. That's why Paul says you're nut jobs. The only way that you can speak in tongues in a way to someone else that would help them in any way is if you gave them an interpretation. By the way, how do you cultivate and develop the capacity for interpretation. Well, the Holy Spirit supplies it, but I would recommend that you practice it. The Bible says, Paul says, let him who speaks in an unknown tongue pray that he might interpret. But Paul says, I, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. There is something about praying in tongues that Paul was aware of the benefit that it had in his life. And he was so aware of that benefit that he that he practiced tongues often, so often that he was confident that he did it more than the Corinthian church. In other words, Paul knew something about the benefit of speaking in tongues, of praying in the Spirit. 
He knew something of its benefit, and so he did it a lot. And I want to discover and experience for myself what Paul knew about the benefit of speaking in tongues, of praying in the Spirit. And I hope that after these few moments together, you will too. God bless.